Hi there. Welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough. It's Easter time 2022, and we've decided to make you a special Easter program. We're going to visit some of the churches we've seen before, and two we most definitely have not seen before, slightly outside our area. We're going to film it through the prism of that time of enormous upheaval in the Christian Church, the Reformation, and Henry VIII's subsequent dissolution of the monasteries. Come with us, we're going to tell you an extraordinary story. The huge challenge to the power and position of the Catholic Church in Europe that was the Reformation sent shockwaves throughout the world. Theological differences were exacerbated by accusations of corruption and immorality, all made much easier to communicate by the invention of the printing press. A kind of perfect storm. Martin Luther was able to spread his ideas throughout Europe and he set in motion the division of the church, Christian church, into the two arms of Protestantism and Catholicism. In the Kingdom of England, however, it took a slightly different turn. King Henry VIII's political difficulties, particularly with regard to his desperation for a male heir and his stretched exchequer as a result of his wars in Europe, prompted him to separate himself entirely from both the Catholic Church and the European Protestant movement and to sow the beginnings of what would become England's own Protestant Church, the Church of England. Fundamentally, Henry declared himself second only to God in authority over the Church, allowing him to grant himself an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, whereupon he set about acquiring complete control of the Catholic Church's infrastructure. This involved the wholesale closure of religious institutions, the seizure of their assets, the persecution of their supporters, and systematic destruction of their magnificent buildings all over the country. Oxford and the Cotswolds were hugely affected. Herbert Evans, our constant travel companion, wrote of Oxford, in no place in the kingdom were the changes brought about by the Reformation more extensive or more profoundly felt. Two wealthy abbeys, one priory, four friaries, and four colleges belonging to monastic orders disappeared. It's quite hard to get one's mind around the level of destruction that took place. The king used the promise of financial gain to maintain the support of his nobles and while he took for the crown much of the church's land and possessions, he gave many of the buildings to his allies who wasted little time in demolishing them and using their raw materials to build houses for themselves. Some of you may remember our visit to what's left of Hales Abbey, just outside Winchcombe, where we heard the tale of the actions of Lord Seymour of Sewdley, Lord High Admiral of England and brother-in-law of the king. In 1539, at the dissolution, he was granted the Cistercian Abbey of Hales, and looking at what is left now, it's not that easy to imagine the scale of the destruction. The square of arches visible to today's visitor is just the cloister garth. The huge church was just to the north of the cloister, and of that there is nothing left at all by its outline. The same fate befell the similarly large and wealthy Benedictine Abbey at Winchcombe, only a few miles to the south, of which even less remains to remind us of its splendour. To help us fully appreciate the enormity of it all, we're fortunate that there are some survivors. Henry's new Church of England needed some infrastructure of its own. So when he created the See of Gloucester in 1541, St. Peter's Abbey became Gloucester Cathedral. It seems likely that his decision to create the see in the first place was influenced by the royal connections to the abbey. 
as we shall see, it's the burial place of Edward II. So, on the 3rd of September, 1541, the church became the cathedral, the abbot's lodging became the bishop's palace, the prior's house the deanery, and a large part of the monastic precinct was adapted for educational or cathedral use. Thus saving, at least for that time being, what is undoubtedly one of the most important ecclesiastical buildings in the whole United Kingdom. Approaching this wonderful building from the southwest, as we would advise, you get the impression of a church entirely in the perpendicular style. It is, of course, Norman in origin, but the English Gothic style that is known as perpendicular started in around 1350, and it was around this time that much improvement and extension work started on the building. Gloucester is certainly amongst the earliest examples of this classic style of architecture, which continued to be used in the construction of English churches for more than 200 years. The huge tower, built between 1451 and 1457, rises 225 feet, that's just shy of 69 meters, into the sky. It's crowned with an open parapet and wonderful delicate pinnacles. Its corner buttresses and all its facades are covered in intricate carved stonework. And the crowning pinnacles are each like a small version of an entire church tower. It's a truly astonishing example of the brilliance of 15th century stonemasonry. We highly recommend you visit this place and walk as far as it's possible around the building to get as many views of the tower and nave as possible. Entering the church, there's a distinct change in feeling. Huge pillars supporting the arches of the nave are original Norman piers, cylindrical and solid looking. They are a reminder of the antiquity of this building. They are just short of 10 metres high, although their original plinths are hidden by the 18th century stone paved floor. The ceiling which was built between 1239 and 1242, is considered by some to be a little too low. Pevsner suggests it looks like an elegant, graceful hat, hardly fitting the rugged face underneath. The explanation seems to be that, following a fire, masons began the restoration at one end of the church with incorrect measurements, and it is thought that the monks finished the work themselves without the assistance of the craftsmen they'd bad at the beginning. You just can't get the staff, you know. This cathedral is full of treasures. Time restrictions mean we can't give you a full description of them all, but there are three we really would like to show you. First, the monument to Prince Osric, who died in 729, which was erected to him as the founder of the late 7th century Minster. As you can see from Ross's clever high camera angle, he holds the Abbey Church in his left hand and a scepter in his right. Next to him is the tomb that quite probably is responsible for the fact that this building still exists. There had to be some reason Henry VIII decided to create the See of Gloucester, and the fact that King Edward II was buried here could well have been the reason. His effigy is made of alabaster, one of the very first important examples of memorial alabaster in England. He's portrayed as the typical Plantagenet with a fine bearded head flanked by angels. And he holds the royal orb, which is also the first time on an English royal tomb. The top is a complex array of delicate gables and pinnacles. Edward's son was determined to create a memorial as great as any in Europe and it truly is an extraordinary piece of work. It is said that he also commissioned a model of a naval ship in solid gold, which was supposed to sit on the little shelf in front of the tomb. Originally, the stonework would have been highly decorated and coloured, possibly even studded with jewels, but even this building, saved from destruction, was not immune from the iconoclasm of the age. The world-famous east window of this cathedral is astonishing. It reaches from floor to ceiling and is full of fascinating images. It's possible to see this extraordinary window from many different angles. The cathedral has opened the stairways to the upstairs galleries, where the space is brilliantly used to illustrate medieval building techniques, 
with working models and explanatory notes. When we were there, several school parties were visiting and it was wonderful to hear the enthusiastic responses of children of all ages. I mentioned that the church's transformation into a cathedral saved it for the time being, and I used the words advisedly. It had a very narrow escape just after the Civil War. During the Commonwealth, its total destruction was once again planned. Indeed, the demolition of the Lady Chapel and the Little Cloister had already begun, when a grant secured by the Mayor and Corporation in 1656 seems to have saved it from this catastrophe. Just showing we really must keep our eye on our heritage and protect it from the apparently ever-present Philistines. Looking at this extraordinary cloister with its magnificent fan vaulted ceiling, one of the earliest and certainly one of the most spectacular in the whole of England, you realize the astonishing skill of the medieval stonemasons. This was conceived in about 1350. It took about 50 years to build, probably built by several different stonemasons over that period of time. It's quite difficult to tell where they begin and end. But it is really difficult to imagine how anybody could ever think of demolishing such a fabulously beautiful place. It was conceived in around 1350, but it took about 50 years to bring to completion. It seems to have been built by several different masons, but overall this extraordinary place is one of the few works of masonry art that brings tears to the eyes. I think we might return to this place one day to look at it all in more detail, but meanwhile it gives you an idea of the depth of destruction wrought by the powers of the Reformation and the depth of the losses mankind suffered as a result. Bearing in mind that this kind of thing happened all over Europe, and you do have to ask yourself what it is that so often makes us fail to appreciate the achievements of our forefathers. The above-mentioned iconoclasm stretched, of course, to the little country churches as well. These little buildings were decorated in the same spirit as the great monastery churches, albeit by much more primitive artists. Hundreds of churches, some large but many tiny, survive in the region as our travels are confirmed, and here and there there are signs of enormous efforts to protect their decorations from the marauders. But most are stripped of their plaster on which great wall paintings were made which creates an extraordinary contrast between complex and beautiful architecture and plain and austere interiors. Braille's church springs to mind. We revisited this little village recently to look at this lovely church and it reminded us of Evans's heartfelt declaration. He wrote, Braille's church, from its size and massive tower, is known as the Cathedral of the Felden and it well deserves its name. The church stands in the highest part of the village, not far from the inn. Nothing can be finer than the exterior, the lofty tower, 120 foot high and wide in proportion, the long clerestory rising above the aisles, the open foliated parapet on the south side with a cornice elaborately carved with grotesques beneath. The rich orange tints of the stone command our wonder and admiration. Enter the church and alas! the scene has changed. The expectations raised by such an outside are doomed to disappointment. The plaster has been ruthlessly scraped from the walls. Almost every trace of the sanctifying hand of time has been removed, and the whole has a strange cold look, from the contrast with the exterior all the more repellent. Thank goodness for the absolutely delicious steak and ale pie bought in, it should be said, from a local butcher, but served to us with great hospitality at the George, just a few paces from the church. Evans rested here in 1905 when he passed through, describing the George as a comfortable inn, much frequented by hunting men. Not sure about the hunting men, but the comfort is still there. On a much smaller scale still are the two little churches we visited in East Leach, the River Leach divides these two churches and they stand looking at one another across its waters with a determination to retain their place in our lives. Obviously they were originally in two separate parishes, but now they survive for different reasons. 
One, because it is the local place of worship, much loved and looked after by the parish and the community. And the other, as a result of the supreme efforts of the Church's Conservation Trust, one of the several charities in the United Kingdom dedicated to protecting as many as possible of our little churches from ruin. I can't help feeling that, in a violent and confrontational world, we desperately need to preserve these places of peace and tranquility. Certainly, these little churches are a stripped-down version of their original, elaborate manifestation, but they retain their spiritual nature and peaceful atmosphere, so rare in this accelerated and noisy world. Even smaller, but no less wonderful, is the little church at Apple, a village just east of Brails on the ridge near Edge Hill. This little church still serves the little village in which it sits. It was built in the way a doll's house imitates the grandeur of a Georgian townhouse or a Tudor manor. Everything is in miniature. You enter through the base of the 14th century tower, where the ropes of a decent four-bell peel hang from the rafters, and find yourself in a space that belies its tiny outside. It feels almost spacious, it boasts a 14th century piscina, a kind of basin for washing mass vessels, and its southeast window has a dropped sill to provide a sedilia or a seat for the priests. It's certainly possible to imagine the decorations that used to grace the walls. John Piper, the famed 20th century painter and stained glass artist, visited here in 1953, and a simple drawing by him of the church still exists. But perhaps the most extraordinary survivor of all amongst the small churches, only really brought fully to light late in the 20th century, was St Nicholas Church in Oddington and its truly extraordinary war painting. It is wonderful to be back in this little church at Oddington, St Nicholas, um, hidden away in this little copse on the top of the hill, quite a long way from the village. It's great to revisit. The last time we came, we discovered this extraordinary war painting, which was discovered in the early 20th century and then finally restored in the 1970s, uh, with the great help of the Pilgrim Trust. It's one of the most spectacular examples of the internal painting of churches that uh, we've seen in the Cotswolds. Um, and it was saved from the Reformation by the locals. This really is a treasure, and started me on this whole train of thought. This little church is separated from its village for whatever reason, and stands all alone in a copse on a hill. Nothing disturbs the peace of this place but the cawing of the rooks and the occasional moo of a cow. On the north wall is a huge painting of the doom of mankind which even in Pevsna, where normally what you get is pretty dry stuff about architectural details, the excitement comes through the text. It says, On the blank north wall of the nave, the enormous early 15th century wall painting of the Doom was whitewashed in the 16th century, exposed during a restoration of 1912, and cleaned by Eve Baker in 1969. Its position on the north wall is most unusual. The execution is accomplished and the grouping of the figures, especially in the upper section, effective and impressive. In this volume, that is praise indeed. The whole of this church shows evidence of its early decorations and it's possible that there's even more to find in the future. There is a 14th century piece in the chapel below the tower and several original decorations in the niches and on the finials. The lengths of people of this village went to to protect the paintings from the iconoclastic age were exceptional, and it gives us a real insight into how different were our little churches before the Reformation. I love this little place, and return often. It survives now entirely from donations from the public, so please visit and leave a coin or two in the box. And so, to our final visit on this trip down the Age of Destruction. Back into the Vale of Evesham, we are visiting Tewkesbury Abbey. It will already have become clear that with luck and a lot of money, it was just possible to rescue these buildings from the avaricious King Henry. One example of this success is the church at Tewkesbury. This extraordinary parish church, ancient parish church, 
was one of the greatest of the survivors of the Reformation. It sits in this lovely town with an extraordinary mixture of architecture, Tudor, Georgian, all, all the usual mishmash of architectural styles you'll find. But this abbey stands as a monument to medieval stonemasonry. It's wonderful. We're going to show you around. Come with me. This Benedictine abbey was founded in 1087 by a Norman nobleman, Robert Fitzhamon. He died before the completion of the building, which was consecrated in 1121. It's probable that the tower was not completed until the mid-12th century. Just like Gloucester, Tewkesbury is held aloft by enormous drum piers, probably based on the French design of churches in Burgundy, and the full church as we see it today was completed in around 1390, and no further major alterations have been made. It therefore stands as a clear illustration to us of the scale and beauty of the abbey churches of which we have been deprived. This church was destined for destruction like all the rest, until in 1542, the town managed to raise the princely sum of 453 pounds and bought the church from the king. It became their parish church. Subsequently, the Lady Chapel at the East End was demolished. There was a separate square bell tower which had been used as a town jail from 1582, which was demolished in 1816 and only small traces of the monastic buildings remain, but the church itself stands proud. It is full of medieval monuments, mostly surrounding the high altar. There are four chapels ringing the east end of the church, each containing intricate stonework and fascinating statues, and a space now given to the abbey shop, which once served as a grammar school. One of the most bizarre of the monuments is the Wakeman Cenotaph. On the top of the altar tomb is a cadaver lying in an open shroud soon after death and crawling with vermin. This must have given much amusement to the grammar school boys. The other tombs are slightly more traditional, but beautiful nonetheless. There is no doubt that Tewkesbury's investment of that £453 was an excellent one. This little town is a wonderful medieval settlement with buildings laid out in the medieval style, sitting on the confluence of the rivers Severn and the Warwickshire Avon, prone to flooding, but bravely resilient and welcoming to visitors. Come here if you can, enjoy the brilliance of the medieval architects and stonemasons and thank all our lucky stars for the determination of the 16th century townsfolk who saw the value of what they had. We do hope you've enjoyed as much as we have this lovely Easter special of 2022. We've had a lovely time spreading slightly out of our normal area, visiting such fascinating places. The world is going through terrible times at the moment and I would like just briefly to wish the very best of wishes to our viewers in the Ukraine. We have several as it happens and it's rather wonderful that they've been going on looking at our stuff despite the troubles that they're going through. But we would like to wish you all a happy Easter and we will be back in the Cotswolds very soon. We'll see you there. <laughs>